Hey everybody, today Rado previews a prototype of the 7th Citadel. But before I get going, please turn your subtitles on to the Klingon channel so that when I make rules goofs, you'll know what they are. And if you've done that, then welcome to the Citadel, everybody. Although, we're not quite ready yet. There's a little bit more setup I've got to do for this solo run-through that I'm about to show you. I've already chosen my character. It's Arthan, who is a little street urchin who is nimble, quick on their feet, not necessarily the most well-trained in combat. But Arthan starts with this deck of character cards. Watchful, Second Wind, Intuition, Specialty, Thoughts, Determination, Resourceful, Lucky, etc. Now, Whichever of the characters you choose when you're going to start your adventure, you get this same deck of cards. But they are subtly different because this is a quick thinking, fast, young street urchin character. Um, I've got her version or of, of Watchful. But if I were, say, uh, Cassic here, who, by the way, could be a male or female Cassic, your choice. The game uh, works very hard at that sort of stuff. Uh, this is an ex-soldier, and if you look at Cassic's deck, and you compare uh, Cassic's Watchful, they are largely the same, but there are some subtle differences. Specifically, um, the soldier can basically block up to two damage in combat, whereas the street urchin can only block one, but can work their way up to blocking three if they train. So they start off weaker at being watchful, but become even better and faster. Or another one would be, uh, say, drop your guard. A soldier never drops their guard. So, uh, the Cassock version, you uh, you could drop your guard, but you're going to lose a life point unless you got a high proficiency level. So, maybe you don't necessarily want to drop your guard. But a street urchin, they're used to dropping their guard. And when they do it, um, you know, they get the main chaining benefit, and they actually ignore damage. So, she's actually better at you know playing fast and loose, dropping her guard. And all of the different characters you can choose... Uh, have, again, the same basic cards, but subtle tweaks and differences that reveal who they are, where they came from, and how they go about stuff. But this is not my entire deck for Little Arthen. I have to choose an additional set of five skill cards taken from here. And uh, the interesting thing is, when I'm creating Arthen as a character, I can pick any five I want. I can mix and match uh, different types of skills and attributes, or I could focus. The rulebook actually comes with suggestions for Arthen, uh, ideally, would have, I picked them here on the top, stunt, lockpicking, accurate shot, sneaky strike, and stealth because she'd be a little thievy type character. I could totally go with the standard, or I could say to heck with that. How about we give her arcane knowledge, abnegation, force fields, blood pack, and energy drain? Yeah, she's a tough, scrappy street urchin. Who knows magic? Or I could mix and match some of these and some of these. Or I could get out the leadership, authority, relentless assault, meticulous, watch out, reinforcement, or the really strong uh, strength attacky ones, which normally would go to the soldier. Weak points, restore, parade, vigorous, uh, the art of war. So, you can make, uh, even though if you play this character several times over, you can make him or her very, very different from game to game. What the heck? I hadn't thought I was going to do this. I'm going to go crazy. I'm just going to grab a bunch of random cards. Uh, who knows what she learned on the mean streets of wherever she grew up. I'm just going to take that one. I have literally, I might regret this later, uh, because of course the rulebook recommended those five because they have nice synergy and stuff like that. But that's not Arthen. Nobody knows what's going on with her. So, she is now set up, ready to go. Um, and uh, we'll see how well all of that works with just a bunch of random scattershot skills. And, uh, yeah, I'm just mostly doing this for my own benefit. We'll see how it goes. I mean, I've already... Uh, my wife actually played as Arthur before and played her as the little thievy type character. I'm just curious to see what will happen if I don't stick to the, uh, stick to the script. So, okay, she's ready to go. Now, we have to set the stage. A new beginning. This is the introductory scenario that comes with the game. And you'll have to check out the Kickstarter page to know how many different scenarios ultimately come with the full game. But as I understand it, each scenario is, you know, a couple of hours long, uh, you know, give or take. And um, you can play through them you know, over the course of a big, epic, multi-session campaign as your characters level up and get more and more stuff in their deck. But not only do your characters level up, but the world levels up itself. Let me go ahead and give you a sneak peek of that. Uh, your party... 
has all your fellowship of players, although you can be playing solo with just one character, has all these different high-level stats that they will develop over the course of multiple adventures. And not only that, there's a map of the world here that we will eventually start finding new and interesting secrets that we can go seek out and again explore over many 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 adventures and not only that we have our web of destiny which is another way in addition to just putting more cards in our deck that we level up in addition to you know the different stats like defense production knowledge and influence and not only that if we take this whole thing and flip it over, we've got all of these different buildings. Buildings? What does that have to do? Well, um, one of the big elements of this game is, as you play through chapter upon chapter, scenario after scenario, not only do you level up, but you level up the world. And uh, more and more people in this world will come to you and help you build a society. And you will make high-level decisions about how that, how that society advances over time. Now, I'm not going to get into any of that, because you'll have to play for many hours before that stuff starts happening. I am just going to give you a little sneak peek at this new beginning, which is the introductory scenario. This is really kind of a tutorial. But here's the deal. I don't even want to necessarily spoil the surprises that are in here, because this is a fully fleshed out standalone adventure. So I figure, for starters, well, let's just uh, let's have some story time. Um, you can go on ahead and skip this part, I guess, if you don't want to know the story. But not, you're going to need to know it. And it's not that long. It'll just be a little bit of setup. So, folks, the Collapsing Lands. The Kel Protectorate has been at war with a fearsome enemy, the Burrowers, for the last 70 years. Controlled by the mis a mysterious individual, these elongated worms tirelessly dig underground tunnels, causing swaths of territory to sink into the bowels of the earth. After years of helplessness, the Protectorate finally found the Necrodruids, the only defense against this scourge. Though these men and women have rejected sacred principles of their order, drawing on blood and forbidden incantations to create the monstrous plants to combat the burrowers. It's a... Uh, Get comfortable, shall we? Okay. Uh, in the Citadels, the Necro Druid's power centers. Uh, the Necro Druid's power centers. You and me grow and tend to the abominations developed within. Working as gardener slaves, we wi you wish that a fatal accident or death by exhaustion would relieve you of your endless toil. Today's world has clearly changed since the days of our forefathers. The collapsing lands are choked in gloom and dust belched up by the burrowers. This horrific plant, the, the horrific plant creatures created to protect you have spread, often uncontrollably, and now threaten humanity as much as the burrowers. Despite the efforts of what remains of Kel to put an end to their schemes, the mysterious controller of the worms and his brainwashed henchmen are nowhere to be found. Here's the burrowers. Here's the burrowers. It's worms with teeth. Ha! Ah. Okay. How long have you been in the Citadel? You've lost track of time. The absence of a door at the entrance of your cell and the apparent freedom with which you move uh, within the tower occasionally leads you to forget that you are nothing more than a prisoner. Awakened to a, awakening to a cold morning, bathed in pale light, another day, another long day of hard labor awaits you in the sacred grove. One more day added to your interminable sentence, and one less left of your life. Who knows? Perhaps this one will be your last. Suppressing a shudder, your mind drifts to thoughts of the apprentice gardener. His silly antics were a welcome source of amusement not long ago. But now, his mangled left arm, torn from its socket, is fertilizing the plants he used to tend. The reckless boy had been clearing the ground next to a sardonite, mistaking it for a rose of torment without seeking assistance from a harvester. It has been drilled into you that the abominations created by the Necrodruids protect the Citadel and the remains of the Kel Protectorate from the Burrowers. That belief, uh, that, that, the belief was that one day they would help us win the war uh, that has wrought chaos and decimated the once green and populous landscape for more than 70 years. You have little choice but to place your belief in the stories since you have not seen the outside world since your imprisonment. Hey! Enough daydreaming. The ground trembles and rumbles more than usual. 
A sudden violent blast throws you to the floor, shaking the citadel of the necrodruid um, Ninadizir to Ninadirs to its very foundation. The southeast wall, with its dozens of cells, is torn asunder. Screaming prisoners can now be heard over the thunderous collapse as they plummet to the chasm below. Somewhere beyond the clouds of dust and the creaking piles of debris, additional explosions and streaks of strangely colored lightning flash across the sky. Amidst the acrid smoke burning your eyes and throat, you can see the faint outlines of the other prisoners rushing out of your cell. A shrill ringing fills your ears and your heart beats so fast that you feel as if it might burst. You have no idea what just happened, but your instinct bellows at you to get out of here as soon as possible. Gritting your teeth, you tense your muscles and start running. And that's the setting, folks. You are now, here we are, in the Seventh Citadel. And as you can tell, this is a very dark and grim world. So, after reading the story, which didn't really have much in the way of pictures, but again, there's the burrowers, and oh, they're very scary. Um, we have to do a little bit of setup for this. And then it says, hey, don't read anything else until you're told, until you get to the epilogue of this particular adventure. So we um, get our Citadel leaflet, like I gave you the little tour. Uh, we divide 30 hit points amongst all the players. Now I'm playing solo, so I get all 30. If I were playing with another player, I'd get 15 and they'd get 15. So we split it up, but um, little Arthan is on her own today. Each player draws two cards from their action deck. I'm just going ahead and shuffle it up a little bit more. Hopefully get those crazy special cards spread out. One, two. So that's my starting hand. Hand size is four under normal circumstances. And uh, take card 14. Read the text on the back and then put it into play to begin forming the board. Place each character's figure on that card. Uh, special rules. Uh, normally, you can save your progress. And if you want to know about that, go check out my run-through of the original 7th Continent. This uses a lot of the same core systems, but I'll be showing you how it works. But I can't show you how to save your game because you don't save your game in this. But if you want to see how that works, go check out my 7th Continent. Alrighty. May Lady Luck be on your side. we got to get out card 14. That's where we start. And as you can see, these are all the cards that have to do with a new beginning. Now, if this game is anything like Seventh Continent, which if I recall correctly, came with like over a thousand cards, there's going to be a ton more. But these are all the different things we might experience during this adventure. What was it? It was 14, I think. There's 15. Here's number 14. Okay. All righty. Our cell measures barely 15 feet across. The other prisoners are shoving each other to get out before the upper floor collapses into our cell. On the other side, the room opens into a void in the chaos of the garden below. A definitive final exit for our fellow inmates who have been pushed to the brink by exhaustion and despair. So, yay? Okay. Here's where we find ourselves. Um, in our cell, there's the chasm down to the, uh, the chaos below in the garden. Here is a little door that we can follow. Here's some other stuff over here. And as you can see, there are three different things we can interact with. And thus begins our adventure. Now, I've got, what do I got in my hand? I've got some thoughts and I've got some um, abnegation, abnegation. I've got a magic spell I can cast. Okay. Which, um, oh, I can use this anytime I want to discard four cards to generate any special effect I need to do better in a skill check. It's like I can cast a spell that can give me whatever I want, but I have to discard four cards from my deck. And I don't want to do that because when this deck gets emptied out, I have to lose five hit points, and then I can shuffle it, reset it back up. Um, so uh, the more I, the faster I go through my cards, the quicker I am going to die. And if I die, it's all over. I lose all my progress and have to go back to my last save point. All right, so I've got this spell that'll hurt, but it'll give me any results I need, and. I've also got some thoughts about what's going on, uh, which is something that I can use to basically claim another card when I'm doing skill checks. All righty. So I could have thoughts about what's going on. I can cast a spell because, hey, I'm magical. All righty. And I now have a decision. What am I going to do? Am I just going to rush right out the door like everybody else? Am I going to look down over into the chaos below? You can see that's a little look icon. Um, this, is, this map is kind of an investigate icon. So I could investigate the door or I could uh, check out this one, which is the search icon. And 
I can do any of these in any order. Now, if I were playing a multiplayer game and say I had a teammate controlled by another player, this game is very free form. Anybody can pretty much do anything they want at any time if there are action available. So, I mean, we could have the big strong soldier guy do all three of these things and have the kids set back. Or I could go do one thing and the soldier does another. We can make informed decisions about, well, I'm really fast and quick on my feet, uh, whereas he's very strong. Maybe he should do something that looks like it's going to need a lot of strength, etc., etc. But since I'm playing solo, all three of these actions are up for me to do. And now here's the tricky thing, folks. I do not want to spoil this. In case you're ever going to get Seven Citadel, you might want to be surprised by what happens if you look over the chasm or if you try to search through this rubble. Um, so, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Tell you what. I'm actually going to say, hey, let's look over the chasm, but I'm not actually going to interact with that card. I'm just going to show you what it would be. You can read it if you want by pausing the screen, and if you don't, just close your eyes. So, what does this mean? Well, for all three of these actions, they all have the same basic stats, and all actions work the same basic way. It shows you how many cards from your deck, which means you're getting closer to dying the more you go through your cards, you have to draw, and how many successes you have to find on those cards. If you look, say, at this Thoughts card that I drew, I might have drawn this for my deck. If I drew this, it would give me one half a success. That's not good enough. I need a full star to get a success. Now the thing is, these three actions, because of this tutorial, they don't require any successes. They don't require I draw any cards. So I can just say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go look over the chasm. I'm going to go search this uh, rubble over here. I'm going to go investigate the door. I can just do whichever one of these I want. And so, I'm going to say, if you want to look over the cavern, then be prepared to look at card 12. And um, read that. Pause if you want. And, uh, folks, if you don't want to see what, what this is, look away now. And that's what you can see. Go ahead and read and pause if you want. And, folks, you can look again. Uh, card 12 has not been spoiled in case you wanted to keep some of the mystery alive. Me, I'm going to role play a character who, like all the other um, prisoners, wants to get the heck out of here as fast as possible. So she's just going to go on ahead and go check out the door. I am going to show you what happens with the door. But in case, before we rushed out, who knows? Maybe we want to search through this stuff up here. Once again, folks, it says go on ahead and check out card number 10. And now this is an interesting thing. You will notice there are two card number 10s. There's a green one and a gold one. If ever you are told to go look at a card, like in this case, I, I did a check to see if we could search. It required us drawing no cards. It required us losing no, or, you know, no successes, so we're going to succeed. If there are ever uh, multiple green cards of the same number, you pick one randomly. You never know exactly what you'll get when you go searching through uh, you know, that closet or whatever. Um, if there's a gold one, that means you can't look at this one unless all the green ones have been gone. And so what that means is there's probably multiple stages to whatever this is. I'll have to deal with this, and if I successfully deal with it, I'll find out what happens on the gold card. So that's a really common conceit you'll see. Now, again, if you don't want to know what this is, just look away from your screen, and everybody else, pause and read that story, because I'm not going to spoil it for anybody else. And if you've unpaused now, go on ahead and check out, here's what we found. And um, as you can see, this requires a skill test. You have to draw a certain number of cards. And I am not going to do this because, again, that would be a big spoiler. It means we'd find out what this card is. Everybody, you can look again. Anybody who didn't want the spoiler because they actually want to... But i, I got to show you the game. So, okay. I'm going to say Arthur here. She was too afraid to look over the, or, you know, investigate that stuff. She's just beaten feet out of here, which means I have to investigate. I have to spend, I don't draw any cards because it doesn't, I could draw cards. I could draw 15 cards if I wanted, but since I need no successes, there's no reason to do that. So I'm going to draw no cards. I need no successes. I get card 15 uh, from uh, the deck. Let's find that. Dippity dippity. Dippity doo. Da 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 da. Uh, if I can find it, I can count. 12, 13, 15. You'll, by the way, you'll notice there's no 14. That is because I am playing with the prototype today. And so, not surprisingly, uh, I don't have access to everything. I, this is like just like a little semi-guided tour. But anyway, card 15. And, oh, you'll notice this is a two-stepper as well. So, folks, here we get into spoiler territory. Dozens of prisoners run past your cell. 
They're about to char- you're about to charge after them when a terrible crash deafens you. Tons of stone have dropped into the corridor, filling the space with thick, billowing dust. Wailing and cries of help for help echo throughout the corridor. Oh, things are not good today. And so, we have a new event that we have to deal with. And this requires a new skill check we have to do. Now, you'll notice this big arrow. That means I take it and I put it over here. And this arrow, these are both the same icon. And what that means is this now replaces this. I'm still here in the room. Um, you know, I did a thing which said, hey, put this out here. And now there's billowing smoke at the door. I could now, before I deal with this, I could go on ahead and, you know, I could mess with these. But because this, this golden arrow effectively replaces this. I can't interact with this anymore. Instead, I interact with this card. And if we look at the end of this card, it says, I have to move it. It is time to move. And to pass this test, I need to draw at least one, but I can draw as many cards as I want. Although the interesting thing is, it's not going to be hard to run through here because I don't need any successes. So this basically represents me having to burn some cards to spend some time running through this door. So let's go on ahead and do that. I will draw a card from my deck. It is give it your all. And now I am very sad. This is a card that when you're doing a test, all you care about is the stuff over here. You care about all this stuff when it's in your hand, like my abne abnegation card. Um, but now since we're doing it as a test, you care about this? I have one and a half successes and I have strength. This would have been a great card to, to draw when I was say, I don't know, trying to um, you know lift a heavy boulder or something like that. I drew this in a terrible time. But anyway, so I drew it. I don't keep it. It gets discarded. I had successes, but ironically, I needed no successes here. I needed zero successes, although I got one and a half. And that means we can continue. I rush out of my cell after my fellow inmates. No matter what happens, I swear I'll never set foot in there again. And this little symbol means, whenever you see it, it tells you um, to replace this card, this green card, with the golden version of this card. And then it also adds, I need to move on to the new space. So I put this here. I replace, um, do, 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 do. so I've got the new one. Bye-bye. That um, This actually goes into um, what's called the past. It's like a special place where a card, you know, sometimes you might actually have to deal with stuff again in the future. So that's gone. Unless it tells me to banish it, in which case it's removed from the game forever. Then it goes into the banish section. But anyway, we're now on to the next step. I enter the corridor that runs uh, along the cells of the upper floor. The ceiling is collapsed on the north side, forever sealing access to that part of the citadel. Breathing heavily, with uh, my eyes streaming because of the thick dust, I make my way forward. Okie dokie. So, here we are. And you will notice... We're making a little map, folks. Uh, and that's the, you know, this world grows slowly over time as we find more and more cards. And you can see how they line up so nicely to make a big panoramic image. So remember, it said when we came over here to come here. Now, you will notice, I can look back in this direction. Um, because, I mean, I, I swore I would never return. So you'll notice... Um, I, I can look here to find out whatever's on card 18, but there's more going on. Down over here, number 19 and number 31, there are these little X's. Now, that's because I'm in this hashtag uh, chapter. Um, the game comes with a whole bunch of these cards, and they have different level 1s, 2s, 3s, or 4s. Since I'm in the introductory one, I don't have any of the higher level stuff. I've just got these general purpose hashes. And what this is saying is, put, um, put a hashtag in this direction and a hashtag in that direction taken from this random assortment of stuff. So what that means is I'm now standing in this room and I've got a few different things I can interact with. I can interact with this card and you can see it tells me to interact with this card. I don't have to draw any cards. I don't have to get any successes. I flip it and just deal with whatever it is. The same thing is true over here. I, you know, this is always the case. So, anybody can go on ahead and find out what these are. And maybe, maybe these are monsters to fight. Maybe these are puzzles to solve. Who knows? It could be anything. But I have to deal with whatever these are before I can find out what's actually in those directions. Because card 19 is down here. Card 31 is over here. And right now, I need to explore and find a way out of this. So, I have to choose. And now, 
if I were playing a multiplayer game, somebody else would still be back here in the room. It's like, hey, where'd you go? And they're still back here. They might still be dealing with these things or whatever. Um, now, in addition to whatever the actions are on the card, and again, you can do these actions, spending cards, getting successes. Everybody on their main card has an action they can do whenever they want. Draw one card and discard it, unfortunately. So you're running through energy. Going through your deck, you don't need any successes, but, um, but that lets you move to an adjacent terrain. Although, I just lied to you folks. I said, draw one card, you don't need any successes, you discard it? Uh-uh. Because of this symbol. Whenever you do a test and it has this little symbol, that's telling you, of all the cards you drew, you get to keep one and add it to your hand. So this is a way, you know, I started off by drawing two cards. I've got this spell, I've got my thoughts, and that's it. Now I can play these when I need them for specific uh, challenges and whatnot. I would like more cards in my hand. So whenever you move from one location to another, you have to draw at least one card. But instead of discarding it, like what happened when I ran out of this room so crazily, now when I move around, the cards I draw to spend energy go into my hand so I can do more stuff. Now, for 7th um, Continent fans, this is a bit of a change that you don't automatically keep a card by default. You only keep a card when you're doing tests when it tells you you can. But you're always keeping cards when you move around. Although, remember, my hand size is 4. So that's something to bear in mind as well. So, um, anyway, if there were another player, they'd be stuck back here. They could use their move, and by coming out here to join me, they would have drawn a card so they'd have more options down the road. Or they could have stayed here. We can split up. We can stay together. But if we are together, we can pool our resources and try to deal with problems together. But I'm playing solo today. So, which way should I go? Do I run on over this way or this way? Now, like I said, these are all random cards. So you never know what you're going to get. I don't mind spoiling these so much because they're not really stories. They're just things you'll run into. So, let's say we check out what's over here to the west. So, I don't have to draw any cards. I don't need successes to flip it. I flip it. Damnation! The Dark Marrow, uh, Dark Marrow stands right in the middle of the passageway. It spat its deadly seeds all over the place. If I value my feet, I should avoid stepping on even one of them. So, this is a temporary event. Once I've dealt with it, it'll go into the past. It'll be gone, so I won't run into this again. So, and this is interesting. This game, like Seventh Continent before, it includes little, um, oh, what do you call them? Kind of like escape room puzzles. This one is... I uh, count how many seeds are lying on the ground and take the corresponding numbered card. If I get the wrong card, I stepped on a seed and it explodes, and I'll have to take a status card, which is probably not a good card that I won't be happy about. Um, so, now I could do this, but I'm not going to spoil this for you, folks. Um, but I mean, you can count count how many um, how many seeds there are, and um, you know if you if you count 25, then take card 25. If card 25 has that little symbol on it, you means you got it right. And if not, kerblooey, it blows up. So this is um, right, oh, and this is something I have to deal with right now. All righty, all righty. Hmm. I don't want I don't I don't want to spoil that though. So I'm just going to say I didn't go that way. But I am happy to have shown this to you because it gives you an idea that in addition to skill checks and traveling and leveling up, sometimes there's just little puzzles that um, you know can occupy your brain in this game too. So let's say I chose not to go that way. Okay. Because I, I don't want to show you the end results. Let's say we go south. What happens if we try to go south? Well, again, I have to interact with this card, which um, in this case, right now I'm not having to spend any energy. Everything's going easy going. But I'll start spending energy pretty soon. I flip it. And total chaos reigns in the corridor. Prisoners are shoving each other to reach the exit as fast as they can, as it's now survival of the fittest or the sneakiest. So, I have a choice. I can either try to sneak along, remaining unnoticed until things calm down, or I can fight. And I can use my fists, my feet, my elbows to fight my way through. And I've got to make one of these choices because this little explosion thing means it's mandatory. Uh, sometimes you reveal a card and you can walk away and say, oh, I'll deal with that later. I'm not ready for it now. But if it's a red explosion like that, I must do one of these. And um, the rewards are, if I sneak successfully, I'll, I'll remain unnoticed. And I'll get to, um, one of the cards I drew to pass the test, I'll get to add to my hand. So I've got more hand size. Um, but if I fail, uh, this is, says, somebody shoves me to the ground and I'm trampled. Alrighty, which means I will have to discard five cards from my deck. 
um, for each involved character. Yikes. And I have to discard cards that are cumbersome. So if I was carrying something that was cumbersome, which I'm not, I'm not carrying anything at the moment, I'd lose it in getting trampled. So this is dangerous. But instead, I could say I'm going to fight, fight, fight. And um, I need three successes as opposed to one. And if I do it during the reveal step, um, when I reveal cards, if I reveal no cards with these special... So if I did it just based solely on my own um, strengths without any cards that have this... These are super items. This basically is a wild that counts as any kind of supplementary action. So if all the cards I reveal... And remember, I have to draw at least three. I can draw as many as I want. And the more I draw, the faster I'm going through my energy. I want to draw as many as I need to to get three successes. Um, but anyway, if after I if I succeed, if there were none of these super souped up icons, I will have done such a great job. I'd be so proud of myself. I'll get three discarded cards and put them back in my death. I'll get a second uh, a second win. But if I fail. If I draw three or more cards and I don't get three successes, I meet my match and manage to get away with a bloody nose and I take damage. Which means I'll literally lose one hit point. And if I lose all my hit points and I'm by myself, it's game over. Now, if there are other players, if I'm playing with multiple players, one player can lose all their hit points and the other players can keep on going and finish and potentially even wake their teammates back up from unconsciousness. But if everybody goes unconscious, it's over. So I gotta choose. Um, let's see here. I... I think I will do the sneaky thing. Because, hey, I'm, I'm kind of a sneaky little character. Um, although, really, what I'd want to do is decide based on, do I have any of these spells that will help? Uh, or any you know, these abilities? Um, because uh, once I choose, this symbol means I can apply this card. I can have thoughts about any test I do. And if I play this card, then I will discard this card, and I get to keep one of the cards that I drew during the test. So if I draw a bunch of cards and I like one, instead of discarding it, I can discard this to get the card I drew. So I can basically upgrade this into other stuff because I have thoughts about things while I'm doing the test. So if I want to play this, I probably want to draw a bunch of cards instead of just drawing one or more card. Now the other one is um, a um, Abnegation. I could play this and this says, hey, discard four cards to give myself a super symbol. Um, so that might help me if I had other cards that said, hey, if you have that super symbol, get to do things. This is not going to help me right now. If I want to have thoughts about this, I want to draw a bunch of cards. So with that in mind, do I want to fight? Because here's the deal. I could draw 10 cards to get the three successes. I could draw 10 cards to try to get the one success. But you'll notice there's another difference. This has a chain. And what this chain means is my successes are limited on this one. I could draw as many cards as I want, but I can only use one of the cards I draw to apply successes. Whereas this, I can draw as many cards as I want, and all the cards I draw can go towards success. And that's tricky because you will notice a lot of times cards only have half successes. This won't get me a success. But if I draw two cards and I have a card that has an arrow or a star on the right... Hey, that goes from being worth no successes to two successes. But this would be a case where I got two successes by using two cards. The problem is, this says, because of the chain, I'm limited to only using one of the cards I drew. So I, mean, so I want to draw a bunch of cards specifically so I up my chances of getting a single card that will give me the single, single success I need. This one, I could draw a bunch of cards and then I could combine, I could mix and match those cards to give myself all kinds of rewards. So which one do I want to do? Either way, I think I'm going to draw a bunch of cards. So I'll be sneaky. That seems to be more thematically appropriate. So I can draw as many cards as I want. Only one of them needs to be a success. And remember, this means I'm burning through energy. Let's say I'm going to draw three. I could draw two, but then I'm li limiting my chance. I don't want... I, and Because if I fail, remember, I'm going to get crushed. I'm going to lose five cards. So I'm going to be a little bit more cautious and draw three. Now you can draw as many as you want. And by the way, again... If I were here with someone else, and I declared to everybody, I'm doing this thing, then the other players have the opportunity to say, well, you know what? I'm going to join. And they could choose to help out. Now, if they're coming along and helping me, like good old Kasich over here, if he wanted to join me in this sneaking around, 
They don't draw cards like I do, but if Kasich had cards in his hand that he wanted to play to give me supplemental bonuses and whatnot to help me succeed, he could do that. And the nice thing is he does it after I draw my cards. So if I draw and fail, I could still... Maybe Kasich could save the day. But here's the problem. For uh, Kasich to use cards, he has to bury cards. Every time somebody who is assisting you in a multiplayer game wants to help, for every card they play, they have to take a card from their deck and block it. Which means it's gone until you find a way to get it back. So this is a way that players can help each other, but at a very big cost to themselves. Now again, I'm playing solo, so none of that matters. But I just wanted to kind of explain how that works. I'm going to try to be sneaky. I am drawing three cards to be on the safe side. And here we go. Let's see what I got. I got... Okay, I overpaid. Well, no, I didn't. Here's the deal. If I had... Well, okay. If I had just drawn this card, I had the success. I actually have two total successes. Plus, I've got two flags and a stealthy cloak. Now, these don't matter. Although, if I had a card that said, hey, if you get a stealthy cloak while doing a thing, play this card and do whatever. But my cards don't really benefit from that stuff. So I got all these cards. I have more than enough successes. I have two. But remember, even though I have two successes here, the test says I can only use one of the cards. So this card would not have saved me. This card would not have saved me. If I'd drawn two cards and gotten only these, hey, they're a success. But this says I can only apply one of them, so I would have failed. So it's a good thing I drew this one. This was a success I needed. And because I've remained unnoticed until things have calmed down, I get to take one of these cards and add it to my hand. Resourceful, authority, or dropping my guard, which I talked about before, which will help in a fight. Resourceful. Um, a resourceful gives me more flexibility about these chains. Because remember... This test, because I was chained, I was limited to only one card applying to my success. But being resourceful would let me apply one or maybe even two cards I drew um, to my success So I, because I could more easily overcome it. That would be a very nice card to have in the future. And since it says, be a nice succeed, I get to keep one, I'm going to add resourceful to my hand. Now these other cards are about to get discarded. However, I have thoughts. If I play this... Because um, this card isn't doing anything for me. I could discard it to add authority or drop my guard. So I could be ready for a fight. Or what's this one? When I apply the following effects uh, during another player's action, I do not have to block. All right. So this one's not as useful since I'm playing solo. There are no other players. I don't think I want to keep that one. But this would be really great if I was helping someone else. So I'm going to keep drop my guard. This is going to help me stay out of trouble in a fight. And so now I've got three of my maximum hand size of four because I had a thought while sneaking through all the chaos. All right. And now, um, the other thing, this card mentions up here, this little symbol means after I've dealt with this card one way or the other, whatever success or failure on either of these options, I now replace this card with what's supposed to be there. So now I go and find card number 19 and this card goes in the past. Bye-bye. Might see you again some point in the future, which has to do with the save system. All right, but anyway, I need card 19. All righty, the story continues, folks. I make my way down the corridor, leaning against the walls to avoid collapsing with each new tremor. It's, it is as if I know every slab, having walked these halls for too many years. At dawn to the garden and at nightfall, exhausted back to myself. Strangely, I feel a mix of worry and relief as I walk through this familiar setting. By the end of the day... There will likely be nothing left of this place. All right. Hopefully I make it out. So, we now see the corridor continues. All righty. Here we are. And what do we got going on? Well, I could investigate over here. It wouldn't cost me anything. Um, no failures. We, we see what we find out. Or, again, I have another thing blocking my way going down south. All right. So, because there's one of these, i got to put another one of these cards out here. There we go. I have no idea what that is. Um, I know it's not counting seeds, because I, I didn't do that. Anyway, oh, but by the way, I'm sorry. I So, all right, so this is here. Now, I'm still up in this room. I could still do this. I could look back where I came from. Or, remember, at any time, I can draw a card and keep it to move forward. I'm just going to move forward. All righty. I drew a card, and I'm going to keep my Jack of All Trades, um, which again is one that will generate, you know, it generates one. If I draw this as a test, I get one of the super symbols, but if I play this during a test, because it's in my hand, I get the super symbol. Um, which, although none of my cards really use that. 
Maybe because I didn't actually make a very well-balanced deck. Who knows? Anyway, though. So now I'm down here. Am I going to investigate over here? I'm not going to, but if you don't mind spoilers, I'll show you what card 36 would be. And again, pause if you want and read that. And look away if you don't want to know. And um, then, here's what you found. Okay. And again, pause and read that if you want to. And, um, and if you don't, fine. We're putting it back. Folks, you can look again. Although, here's one thing I'll show you. There's two 36s. It could have been either of these things. So folks who watched the video and paused and saw what was over here, the next time you play, it might be something different over there. You can never be sure um, because, uh, you know, it's, it's different things. But anyway, I'm not going over there. I'm not investigating that right now. I'm just, you know, try, I'm just trying to get the heck out of here. No time for dilly-dally. All right, so I am going to, again, I don't have to draw anything. I don't need any successes. Let's flip this and see what we found. Where's Walda? I run into a prisoner crawling around making strange little squeals. Poor man. Uh, it was the lockup. It must have made him lose his mind. Or perhaps he took a rock to his head. I ask him, why is he not running away to safety? And he explains quite lucidly that his best friend, Walda, a mouse with an ashy coat, got scared and ran off. He begs me to help him find her. And um, when I read the epilogue, which is to say, once we finish this entire adventure, banish this card. So this, you know, this is an important moment. And once again, I've got a choice. I could help him look around. And, my gosh, this is impossible. Because I need four successes. I can draw as many cards as I want. But, I can again, it's chained. So I can only use one. There is not a single card in my deck that generates four successes by itself. So what this is saying is, this is practically impossible. So instead of that, um, right. If I banished a 158 card, then um, I, I um, well, apparently... A 158 card is something important that I might have found. Maybe that was back over here. Who knows? So, um, suddenly it becomes very easy. I, I just need one success, and I'm not chained anymore, so I can use as many cards as I want. And it becomes very easy to find the rat if I have dealt with something somewhere else. And, as you can see, this is a quest. Now, if I try this and succeed, I'll get 20, a card 29. And I will banish this. This will go away forever. It also gets banished if I never deal with this before the adventure is over. If I fail, uh, I might need to look... I, might, I might, need, might as well look for a needle in a haystack and I banish. So I have this choice right now. Um, although, uh, although, you'll notice, there's no little explosion on this. So... It doesn't, I don't have to deal with this right now. This is going to stay here. That other, you know, that the, the crazy chaos, that I had to deal with. This stays here. If I want to keep going, I got to deal with this. But maybe now I'd want to come back up here, come over here, or, or investigate and see if I could find out whatever card 158 is so I could deal with this. But uh-uh. Um, you know what? Arthen, she ain't got time for this. She's going to go on ahead and say, well, yeah, I can draw as many cards as I want. I need four successes. She's not even going to try. I'm just going to make nice with the guy. I drew a card, and it's at the double. And um, this doesn't say anything about getting to keep, so I fail. And, you know, I might as well look for Neil Haystack. Banish. This is gone. And then once again, now once I've dealt with it one way or the other, it gets replaced with card 26. I'm sorry, Walda. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. It's like, Wilson! Why didn't they name him Wilson? Oh, because it's Where's Waldo? Where's Walda? Wilson! I left Walda behind. All right, but anyway, we're moving down, down the road to card 26. Oh, and you'll notice there's a gold card 26, so this is a multi-stager. Let's take a look. All right. A strange creature ambles aimlessly in the corridor. I slowly approach with my palms open, showing that I mean no harm. It seems startled and begins aggressively waving a jagged piece of wood in an attempt to strike me. Folks, we got a fight on our hands. Okay, this becomes a, another ongoing event that I have to deal with. This is a chained combat. And this actually shows multi-stage combat in the game, which is a big new feature that is a radical change from the way that um, Seventh Continent worked. In Seventh Continent, and in all the tests you've seen me do so far, they're one and done, binary. You succeed or you fail. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you fail. You deal with it and you move on. These are multi-stage. And that's what this die is for. You may have noticed I've had this little die this whole time. I have to defeat two stages of fighting this little creepy um, wood stick 
crazy eyeball monster. And I use this die to keep track of my success. The first stage of the fight, I need to get three successes. So I put this little three here. Once this die has counted down from three, two, one, zero, then if I succeed and move this to, if I get full success, this moves down here, and now I need to change it to get four successes. So I need seven total successes to beat this guy, but I can do it over multiple turns. And like I said, this is very different. In um, traditionally, you have to just get it all done all at once. But here I can I can fight and I can leave and I can come back. I can start fighting and other people could finish the fight. It gives you a lot more flexibility. But I got to do it in two stages. Now, for um, during the first stage, when I'm trying to bunch through these, th these first three points of damage I've got to do, every time I fail, I discard two cards from my deck, but one of them I get to keep and add to my hand. So I'm burning energy to keep fighting this guy, so I need to drag him down as fast as I can so it comes down here. Then he gets desperate, and for every round I spend fighting him on the four level, I start taking damage, which is very ouch. But if I beat him, then it slides down here and it says, hey, go on ahead and reveal the appropriate card for where we're going. Okay, so, and that's kind of scary. If I was traveling with somebody else, um, you know, the fighter might step up and say, take it easy, little kid, I got this. And because maybe that player has some really good combat cards in their hand, and maybe I say, oh, but I've got a good one too, I'll help you. And if I were helping, then again, I'd have to start blocking cards to be able to help, so I can play cards from my hand, or equipment that I'm carrying around with me. But, as it is, I am on my own. And another thing, by the way, folks, this is another chain. So, I've got to do three, I have to get three successes, but no matter how many cards I draw when I make the attempt, again, only one of them can give me the success I need. Um, you know, so if I draw three cards and I have three successes, um, only one of the cards, hopefully one of those cards gives me a success. So you can see why this is going to take several rounds of combat for me to be able to get through it. Unless, for example, I had some cards that would help out. Let's see, this one just gives me another wild. This one, oh... Dropping my guard will help in this fight because since I am actually doing a combat check, you can see there's the combat token, that means I could play this to supplement my at attempts. And this chain means two of the cards that I draw can um, apply successes. And also, I will get to ignore any damage. Now here's the deal. I think I'd rather ignore the damage when he's doing damage to me later. But I could use it right now to get through the first stage quicker. But either way, once I use the card, it's gone. So that's something I've got to bear in mind. Do any of my other cards help me right now? Let's see, so I've got two cards that basically give me this wild and no cards with the Jack of All Trades and the Abnegation. And neither of these and none of these cards want me to produce these symbols. Because sometimes the cards will say, hey, if you can produce a cloak in a fight, then consider then play this and it's a backstab and you do you get three successes. You know, that kind of stuff. So I don't really have a good hand to fight right now. It might make sense for me to come back, even if for no other reason, because every time I walk, remember, I spend energy, but I add this card to my hand. Although now I'll have to start discarding cards. And maybe I'll find a good attack card that will help me fight him. Now, me, again, I ain't got time for that. So we're just going to go for it. And how many cards do I draw? If I draw one, I do not... You saw how before, I drew three, um, and only one of the three cards had a single success. So maybe I should just go on ahead. For my first round, I'm going to draw three. And um, wish me luck. Boom. <gasps> hey, folks. You saw me shuffle. I just got lucky. Everybody has one lucky card in their deck, which provides two successes. So I also got the Art of War. Oh, oh shoot. This would be nice. But um, And I've got Focusing. All right. But um, you know, neither of these... Remember, I, I, because of the chain, I only get to use one. I'm using Lucky. That is two successes. Bimpity bop, he's down to one hit point on his first round. But since I have not succeeded, I didn't get him down to nothing, I fail. I discard two cards because I'm losing energy, but I get to keep one of them. And maybe they'll, right, I can get some determin. Oh, how about some determination? Discard this um, during the prep step. Uh, which gives me a guaranteed success. See, as is normally, you can play cards after you draw. So you can, but this one says, oh, for determination, I have to play it before I draw. And I don't know if I need it, but this is a guaranteed success. And my other one, I could get my second wind, um, which means I could just rest. It um, doesn't require me to spend any energy to do it. 
I don't fail, and I get to recover three cards from my discard pile. Um, or, uh, or, or if it's the only card I have in my hand, five. And then it gets blocked. This doesn't go in the discard pile. This is just gone. I can't rest anymore. I would love to get some rest back and get some energy back, but no. I am going to approach this fight with determination. Although, remember, my hand size is four, so now i got to get rid of one of these. And my Agnegation is nowhere near as good as my uh, Jack of All Trades, so I'll dump that. Okay. And, folks, I'm getting closer and closer to going through the deck. And remember, uh, anytime I want... I can take this card and shuffle it back into my deck if I want to get cards back. But every time I do that, I lose five hit points. So I don't want to do that until I've made it through the deck. But anyway, that was a successful first round. Now, again, he's just standing there. I could walk away. I could do other stuff. Other players could jump in. You have a lot more flexibility because um, these fights can go on for quite a while. You could leave them, run away. If I was almost dead, I could stop and rest because he doesn't want to fight me. He's just blocking the corridor. So he's not going to chase me. But anyway, I'm going to go again. And... Do I use the Determination? Yes. Uh, and what that means, remember, I can draw as many cards as I want. Only one of them will be successful. But before... I mean, and I could play this normally after, but in this case, Determination had to be played before. I'm going to be determined about this. I'm drawing one card, and it had no successes. So I would have wasted around. I would have discarded two more cards, um, although I would have kept one of them. Um, but say goodbye to Watchful, um, because I'm not getting to keep any of these. Because I, I here's the one success I needed. And boom, we have nailed it. So I don't lose more cards. Now it switches to a four, and the fight continues. But now, I think, is a good time to be resourceful because... Um, although, man, if this were the only card in my hand, then I would get plus two. I could use three total cards in this combat. And by the way, I should say, the reason I keep saying that when you're in a chained event, you can only use one of the cards you drew, no matter how many cards you drew, that's because of this little one here. This is telling me two things. That I have to draw at least one card, and that at most, only one card can apply to the test. If this were a little 3+, plus, then I would have to draw at least three cards, but at most, three only three cards could be applied towards my success. So anyway... This is this is what makes this tough. This is why I have to fight for multiple turns, because I can only use one card. But, but, hey, if I drop my guard, I get to keep plus one. And if I am resourceful, I can keep two. Although, oh, oh, okay. So if I got rid of this Jack of All Trades so I could get the plus two, that would make sense. So maybe I should go do something just to get this Jack of Trades uh, this Jack of All Trades out of my hand, because then if I play this to help me in the first round of combat, then if I play this to help me in the next round of combat, I'll get plus two. That makes sense, it sense, sense. Um, right. So let's go on ahead and use the fight, saving my resourceful for the big um, second hit. Let's um, prepare to drop my guard and pull because uh, I'm going to want to avoid damage. Now, Remember, I do not have to play cards right now, unlike a lot of these sorts of adventure games where you have to commit everything before the fight starts, before you roll the dice, or in this case, draw the cards. Uh, although that's not entirely true. If I had any possessions, like say I had a special item that would help me now, you have to commit the items before you start drawing. But after you are finished drawing and you reveal and you find out whether things went well or not, then you can play cards from your hand, or if you're and anybody else who's involved, they can play cards from their hand too, if they block cards, so they basically lose them, um, then, you see, so you can respond to a bit of bad luck. But in this case, but still, so I'm going to probably play resourceful afterwards, and because I know, well, it's not resourceful, but because I know I'm going to be able to apply two of the three, six, three cards instead of one when I drop my guard, how many cards do I want to draw? Well, I know my luck is gone. The only card that had, um, you know, pure that had two cards, Lucky is gone, and I don't remember. I have a couple of cards that have no successes on them, and only one of them has come out. So, let's go on ahead and draw three, and knowing that I'll be able to use two of these, hopefully I'll get two successes. So, although that's a bit of a stretch, three cards is pretty much guaranteed you'll get one success, maybe two. If I really wanted to ensure, I should probably draw four, because amongst these, two, some combination of two of these. Should, you, you know, got with my dropping of my guard should give me success and I would like to get more than I mean I'd like to get three successes if possible 
It's possible I could chain together two cards to get three successes. Yeah, what the heck? Let's go for it. Let's go big. Let's draw four cards. And now, let's find out what we got. All right, that's not very good. Oh, but here we go. That's chain. There's a success. Oh, and we needed another, um, we needed another right. All right, so that wasn't as good as I had hoped. Uh, in fact, yeah, this is the best I can do. Um, this, yeah, I, I got two successes off of this. I drew four cards, and I, the best I can do out of them, because I didn't get any more left stars, unfortunately. If I had another left star, then I could continue, and you can see how I could maybe get a big old chain of multiple cards. But again, I have to be able to use multiple cards. So, like... If this card had been a half and a thing, you could see how with two cards I could have gotten three successes. But still, I'm not going to complain. I get two successes. Although, because of the chain, I only get one normally. But this is when I say, I'm dropping my guard. I'm playing this, and that means I can use two, and I'm going to ignore any damage. All damage is coming my way. So that means I got two successes. So I went from four to two. Boom. And now I will go on ahead and say goodbye to all these cards. Because um, I already thought about them earlier, and, it, and the act doesn't say I get to keep any. Oh, wait, no, hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on a second. Read the fine print, Rotto. So, I'm here. It says because I failed, I take two damage, right? But uh, I get to keep one of the cards I drew. Now, I don't take any damage, because I dropped my guard, so I, avo I avoided damage. But still, of these four cards, I get to keep one of them. Now, this stunt will help me when I'm doing acrobatics um, or when I'm... I'm sorry, what is that symbol? Oh, right, dodging. Um, if I pull a stunt when I'm in a fight, when I'm doing acrobatics or I'm dodging something, what this means is if on any of the cards I drew, if there was a, uh, uh, a cloak, then... I can get a, I can get a, basically a success for every cloak. I can convert cloaks into successes if I pull a stunt. And I could do that up to two times. Um, or uh, you know, I could use them to avoid damage. But then this is gone. So this is very nice to have if I draw cloaks. Alrighty. If I go with the intuition, if I keep this. Because remember now, I, when you're doing the test, all you care about is what's over here. When they're in your hand, all you care about is what's over here. So this is now a new thing. Anytime I want... I can uh, engage in some intuition, look at the top four cards of my draw pile, and put them back in any order I want, so that I can guarantee the successes I need. Oh, that's a very nice. I like that. A sneaky strike, which I can use in combat, um, which says, while I'm drawing cards, because um, if I've got two fists, that can be a success, or two cloaks can be a block. So you can see how... Um, this jack of all trades, which when I use this, if I use this in a fight, I'm a jack of all trades, it generates the wild. That means it generates anything I want. The fist, the cloak, the flag, or the magic. So that could help me play these other cards to successful effect. So suddenly my jack of all trades is useful. Oh, and now I can also have some foresight. Uh, during the consequence step, which is at the end, after I'm finding out if I succeeded or not. Or no, this is after I, I'm actually dealing with the results of uh, how I drew and how I played cards. Um, I can shuffle one card that I've revealed into my action deck. So, I, one of the cards that would have been discarded and I lose energy, I can get back. That's nice, but not nice enough. I am keeping... You know what? If I'd be tempted to keep this stunt, but uh-uh. I need some intuition, y'all. Alrighty. That's going to save my bacon. And, um, right. So, I avoided damage. I need to do two more damage. And, now, I'm again, I am free to walk around and do whatever I want. This guy doesn't even want to fight me. Look at him. So... Um, if I would like to have some intuition right now, uh, it's there's no challenge to it. I don't draw cards. I just look at the top four cards of my draw pile. Oh, which, by the way, there are only two. But that means I can rearrange them to guaranteed win this last fight. So before I play my intuition, I am going to um, recover, which means I lose five hit points. I'm going to take all these cards, shuffle them back, so I'm doing this, and now, as an action, I'm going to have some intuition. I draw four. One, two, three, four. And, oh yeah. Okay, yeah, this is what I want. I want these two cards, because these two cards in combination will give me the two successes I need to finish this thing off. This would give me none, and this would give me one. So, um, 
Right. So I put them back wherever I want. I'll put them down like this. I'll put these down like this. I know if I draw two cards and I can use those two cards, I will win this fight because I just had some intuition. Alrighty. I'm back, beastie. Did you, did you miss me? I'm going to draw two cards. One, two. And I know, hey, that's success. But remember, I can only use one card at a time, except... I'm so resourceful that um, I get to use one extra card in the chain that I drew. And that meant both these were done. And boom -bitty boom uh, he is toast. And my reward is I now get to find out what's in card 26. Okay. 26. Dee, dee, dee. Here we go. Uh, and 26 is another card that has multiple... Uh, oh! Oh, right. Oh, no, no. Card six. This is 26. He was... The green 26. We were always going to fight him. After beating him, I go and I get the yellow. And, oh, in the dim light of the corridor, I inch my way uh, forward using the cracks and gaps created by the succession of tremors. I walk past the half-open door on the west side and cannot suppress a shudder of fear. The room beyond it is the chamber of questions. And anyone entering it has always confessed their secrets, even if they have none to hide. Enraged howls ring out from the cell across the way. All right. And the adventure continues. And we have to put a new little hoozy majig down here. And we can see we need to put a little hoozy majig over here. And the adventure is getting bigger, folks, as we try to escape the Seventh Citadel. What? Oh, and so, or at least I'm assuming it's the Seventh Citadel. I haven't played that far. So um, now I, I'm down to one card in my hand. I'm going ahead and walk. Because uh, remember, every time I walk, I get to draw and keep a card which is I am now watchful, which means I can use anything to avoid damage. So this uh, is pretty handy. Alrighty. And I've got to make a decision. There was, I mean, I could, let's look at it a bit closer. I could listen to the, the screams and the agony over here, or I could try to go through this door, or I could just keep on heading south. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm not quite sure, folks, but what I am going to do is stop right there. I am not going to reveal. I don't want to spoil anything more. But there is one more big thing. One big thing that I haven't shown you yet. I'm not, I don't want to show you where it is. I don't want to spoil any of the story if I don't have to. But, folks, in addition to having all these scenario booklets that will introduce and walk you through the story and, and set things up for you, there's a book of dialogue that comes with this game. Unlike Seventh Continent, where we were exploring the world, and it was pretty much a barren, empty world just full of beasties and bears. Um, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Just having some flashbacks uh, to uh, my Seventh Encounter, uh, you, know, uh, you know, going out hunting and running across bears. Uh, in this game, we can actually run across people and have conversations. And um, suffice to say, somewhere... In this, um, in this dungeon that we are trying to escape, there is somebody waiting to talk. And so I've already pulled his card out ahead of time. You know, maybe he's further south. Maybe he was back here. Maybe he was one of these things over here. Who knows? But I just want to give you an idea because interacting with people is a big part of the game now. So, uh, again, if you want no spoilers, close your eyes. But at some point, we will find this fine young fellow. And you can read it, pause and read what his situation is. But the important thing is you'll see, um, as long as he's on the table, there's a new interaction. It says, hey, I don't have to draw any cards. I won't have to get failed successes. I can choose to interact with him. And if I, if I talk to him, I read entry eight in the book of dialogue. And so... Um, I, folks, you can look again. I, I've, I've made the card go away. But um, let's say you found this guy and you decided to walk up and talk to him. You go into the book of dialogues, which, you know, not surprisingly, has all kinds of dialogue and, and often, very often, choices. And the interesting thing is, these choices are usually permanent. You make a choice, you have to live with it. This is not the kind of game where you get to go back, oh, let's see what, he's, what he says if we ask him the other question. Um, uh, conversations in here are meaningful and often scary because you don't want to make the wrong thing. Now, in the case of the guy we want to talk to, it said, read entry 8. And I'm going to do that, but for folks who don't want anything spoiled, at this point, it's all spoilers for what that guy has to say. So if you'd like to right now, you can go on ahead and hit that eye up in the top right corner of the screen and go to Final Thoughts and hear what Jen and I thought of the 7th Citadel. Um, in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. But if you didn't, then it's story time. All right, it was entry 8. So... All right, and you stuck around for spoilers. Uh, the mysterious individual speaks before you can open your mouth. Set me free, quickly, before he wakes up. 
he urges in a hurried whisper, nodding um, to the body lying nearby. We're on the same side! So, I can choose. Uh, do I want to free the prisoner? Read entry number one. Or, at my own risk, I can choose to wait. Read entry 15. What would you do? Um, now, okay, since uh, everybody who wanted to avoid spoilers is gone, I think you saw... All right, uh, you saw how he was mysterious... Oh, oh, I didn't show you the other side. Here's the other side. Uh, his head twists in the stocks. Um, we have spent enough time with the other inmates to know that this individual is not from the Citadel, a mysterious outsider. His face still bears the marks of recent interrogation. He stares scornfully, eyes shining with a dark malevolence. Uh, is that a sly smile forming in the corners of his blood-stained mouth? And of course, then you saw... Yep, is that... So do you want to let this guy out? Is that what you would do? Is that what you would do? Well, let me tell you, that's not what I would do. I don't know if I trust this guy. He's an outsider. He's not one of us. At my own, but at my own risk, it says. At my own risk, I'll choose to wait. Which means we read number 15. Alrighty. The man stares at me for several moments. Something has changed in his eyes as he replies to me. Very well. Very well. Fair is fair. What do you want from me? Um, right. Uh, let's see. We, I ask him who he is and what is he doing here. This is an unfortunate misunderstanding. I was delivering a new group of gardeners to the Citadel when they served me up to that rough brute snoozing over there. So what do you say, friends? This guy's a slave catcher. Um, you know, he, he's the one who, who brings people into bondage. Um, right, so again, I can free him, which means read entry number one, same as before, or at my own risk, I can choose to wait. And now folks, I know what you're thinking. You wanna wait, don't you? You let this guy out, no way. But again, it says, at my own risk. So let's go ahead and read number six. Listen, we don't have all day. If the Citadel's crumbling, that means the offensive launched by the Necrodruids has failed and the Controller has found a way past their defenses to finish them off once and for all. Your masters and protectors are dead and the war is lost, he sneers. Even if you survive this place, you won't last two days without the protection of the Necrodruids. Unless you help me out of here, of course. I could be a very powerful ally and perhaps even plead your case to the purveyors. We are everywhere and we have many friends. A crackling sound in the ceiling startles me. There's no time to lose. So, because we've waited this long, it says right here, add to knowledge um, to the fellowship page of the Citadel. We now have more knowledge. We have learned of some mysterious group called the purveyors. And obviously, that's going to come in handy later. Alrighty. Um, if I choose to free the prisoner, read entry 4. It used to be read entry 1, but now it's read entry 4, so things have changed. Um, or, at my own risk, I can continue to wait. And, folks, I am going to stop right there, because I do not want to spoil what happens next. But I just want to give a little bit of a taste um, you know, uh, of how conversations work and Seven Citadel. And now... As before, you can uh, hit that eye in the top right corner screen or follow the show notes to go to final thoughts in a five, a four, a three, a two, a one.